with the director Maxine Trump and uh, forest campaigner for Greenpeace, Richard George. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful uh, movie which put the light on uh, such a uh, strong situation which um, we, we really need to talk about. And I don't know how many musicians or people who follow music uh, know about it. How mm. did you get close to this subject? I was actually making another film um, about the Bering Sea and working with uh, Eskimos further up north in Alaska. And it was actually about how deep sea trawling was affecting the sea and subsistence fishing when I heard about what was ha happening on land. And once you hear about three CEOs, competitors getting together on a tiny boat and going to Alaska, I was like, I've got to try and get a camera. And actually, um, thanks to Greenpeace, who actually gave us that footage of them on the boat together, because I couldn't, they, it was so small that they wouldn't allow any, any camera people onto that boat. So, um, so that's how we actually got that footage from Greenpeace. Yes, and Greenpeace, we see throughout the movie how it's important, especially to educate people on, on all sides, you know, uh, not only the public, but uh, the people. What was quite fascinating for me is to see these great guitar makers that have been making guitars for generations, mm. and yet they've never seen the wood when you know it's not in a in a format like that you know ready to and you probably as Greenpeace you find that most people are completely detached from the reality of nature yeah I think that's true I mean so often um, you know the way companies are on the size of them the people who actually make products very rarely have the time often the inclination to go out and see where these things come from and the second I mean you see it there the second you take them out into the forest and you say well this is what it was like you go around the corner and this is what it's like now as a result of these practices. It's amazing how quickly uh, people will sort of want to get on board. Sure. And for you to see nature, of course, you have mm. a, many experiences of, of uh, uh, documentary making where you are in touch with nature. But how was it to see the trees getting actually cut down? Well, what was really amazing is to get to some of these islands, you have to take these tiny seaplanes and get all of our, of our equipment onto these tiny seaplanes to get, because it's a really re remote area and it's very it's all islands and it's beautiful, I mean, it's majestic nature and the tree size is just huge. Um, so we fly over it um, and you, you see the clear cuts and that's when it really hits you and that's why we had to do helicopter photography because it was just, you just get the, not only the beauty um, and seeing it on the big screen, you're really, I mean I feel, I don't know what you guys feel like, but I feel like I'm actually in the forest when I'm watching it on that side of the screen and that was really important for us to kind of give that sort of immensity to the audience. Sure. So the first, the first touch is the one with nature, and then of course comes the touch with the culture, mm. the culture that is preserving their way of life and their way of uh, deciding how to to do business and and give their business to the next generations. How do you try to to get close to um, making peace with them uh, without you know overstepping and creating? I mean, I think there's, I think there's two cultures in. So this was one of the questions I had, because I'm a campaigner in the UK, and when uh, we heard about the film and I heard about the campaign, um, I had a good conversation with Larry Edwards and some of the other campaigners, and one of the questions I had was was just that, basically, like, how do you deal with this? I mean, these are lands that have been given to Native Americans, Native Alaskans, as a result of year, hundreds of years of oppression by the American government and the, the governments and states that came before that. You know, how can you go over there and say, I know we screwed you around for you know, mm. hundreds of years, but actually now we're going to tell you what to do with your land. But I think you see there's a really interesting uh, end note that came up. You know, the amount of money that the, uh, the shareholders are getting, kind of $4 million, was it roughly? Yeah, four, yeah. And 48 people in the Sea Alaska Corporation are getting nearly $8 million. And I mean, there's two cultures there. There's a very small elite who are making a huge amount of money, and there's a lot of people who aren't getting all uh, a huge amount back and in return for that vast swathes of the Tongass National Park are being destroyed um, and yeah I, so it's but yeah it's, it's really difficult mm. I mean can I add a, lo <laughs> a lovely story about that actually um, I mean it was really hard as a Brit making this film I mean talk about our colonial history and, and what we've done so I came to this story with a lot of white women guilt and thinking how am I going to tell a story about Native Americans 
and we did a ton of test screenings and we actually went out to um, the west coast of America to a place, to an area called Portland in Oregon and there's a um, lots of tribes live around this area it's very forested and we actually went to a tribe that had nothing to do with this issue at all and screened to them and said please tell us what you think because this is a story about Native Americans and they said listen <laughs> Why do you think we're any different than you guys? We've got greedy people that want to make a lot of money, just like you guys do. And it was this real kind of eye-opening situation for me because I came to this story with rose-tinted spectacles of what Native Americans do with their resources, and we're all the same. And that was that was kind of that was brilliant for me as a filmmaker. There, there is a part where you can actually see there it's split the mm -hmm. sort of the culture, but uh, another culture that obviously you talk to in this movie is the musicians who have such a, a physical attachment. I'm sure there's lots of musicians tonight with us. They're, they have a strong, obviously, a physical attachment to the instrument and to the wood because it makes a certain sound and the better the wood, the better the sound. And how do you actually let them see that what, you know, that very object of love is also an object of? Well, it's really interesting. Um, I knew nothing about acoustic guitars. I am completely tone deaf. I know the musicians I like, and thankfully there were some that, that are in this film, because you have to live with that soundtrack for a long time and love the music. Um, but um, what was really interesting, when we were talking to the, to the guitar makers, they really loved this film, because they really want to say to the guitar buyers, to the consumers, you try different sa different word on the top of sustainable words, it doesn't sound that different. Um, and there's been just really recently a very hopeful story. We Last month we went to a tiny island off Canada and actually most of the Haida tribe live in Canada. And they've just gone fully FSC certified with their forestry practices. They actually have higher restrictions on their forestry practices. And they're 40 miles south from, from Sea Alaska. And their, their spruce is slightly wider in ring to, in the the amount of rings per inch. So some of the the Steve Earls um, or the very the huge aficionados about acoustic guitars will say, well, that's got a really wide ring um, to this wood, this soundboard. I don't like it. Doesn't sound any different at all, and yet it's fully sustainable. And um, actually, when Turin Brakes played with our screening yesterday, one of the guys, um, Ollie, had a completely mahogany guitar. And mahogany is very sustainable. There's certain parts of um, the world where you can get mahogany that's sustainable, and probably Richard could say exactly what words are sustainable. But they're really trying hard to make a difference, and it's actually getting the word out to say, try new things, try different words. It's, it's OK. But also the the percentage uh, of wood that's being logged from there that's going to guitars is quite small, mm. right? I mean, you get this at the beginning. The majority of that is going over to Asia. It's pulped, uh, which basically means it's used in packaging, right? And the way that Greenpeace uh, campaigns is we try and find a way that we can explain, uh, find something iconic that will explain a story. So if you, you can make the case quite strongly that these are trees that will take hundreds of years to grow back, so that if we're going to use them, uh, the way that you would use them is in high value products. So each tree is worth more to the people that log it and therefore if they can restrain the amount of logging they're doing, now how much logging is good and how much is bad, leave that aside for a second. But you, what that enables you to do is basically get more money per tree and therefore log fewer trees and therefore have uh, a forestry management that's more sustainable and that's what the model we were trying to persuade them with. Um, yeah, as you see towards the why, end it's... Why, why didn't, why didn't the Greenpeace mm. guy in the film yeah. used the fact that they wanted government lobbying mm. to support them taking over more land yeah. for potential deforestation. And Gibson and, and those, those branded American companies could have supported them in that in return mm. for putting in some regulation on sustainability and, 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 and replanting. I suspect they did. I mean, this is a, a small... Uh, sm small kind of uh, snippets from conversations that would have been having. I mean, that but was that the whole argument. that film made Greenpeace look completely inept. In what way? Well, the, uh, that For not guy, making that argument. That guy didn't make the link, did he? He should have made a deal that supported the lobbying power and, and, and made conditions mm. on the support of those companies in his alliance. I mean, those brands are powerful. They Which employ, is why they employ to, thousands of people. And, and Fender was missing from that. For, you know, to put it in perspective, Fender is a $600 million corporation. Gibson is less than $50 million turnover. Mar and Taylor and Martin even less. So Fender were completely missing from that. But those are powerful lobbying groups. 
It's, a, it's a question that, sorry, actually, no, no, it's no, a question that comes up a lot. Why couldn't um, Greenpeace and actually the guitar guys lobby the government to persuade Sea Alaska to become FSC certified? And there is a rub there because FSC, we, we did a lot of investigation into this, and FSC can't tell anybody how far along they've got into the, uh, into the um, uh, investiga investigation. Um, in the process with Sea Alaska, they can't tell anybody how whether Sea Alaska will be successful or not. And but you, but you don't need FSC in that. Greenpeace should be making that link. What's the point of forming that coalition if you don't use it to support them with the condition that they will replant? But there's only so much you can persuade people who don't want. It's not about replanting in the 600-year-old, 400-year-old mm. trees. It's about finding a way of. Uh, of making the, an economic argument, which is exactly but what we're trying to me. do. Government's role is to regulate. Yes, I mean, obviously, we are primarily here to see a film, um, and I realise that, it, the, that the film seems to sit between being a documentary and being a campaigning film. And in many ways, I, I, it didn't surprise me that, that it was not fully conclusive. And I, I like the way that it didn't preach to me completely and that some of the issues which were not intractable, but, you know, it, it, it asked a lot of questions, but films are there to ask questions. And, you know, I, I just, what worries me is that you see something, it's a snapshot in time, it deals with real issues, and then you know, you just, I'm just wondering in my experience after seeing this film, how likely am I to find out? The all outcome? the time, it Facebook is. is updated all the time because we're really following this issue mm -hmm. um, and it's we hope that they'll be, sorry? It's in real time. Yes, yeah, yeah. we do it a lot. <laughs> Let's see if we have more questions, please. Um, yeah, I thought that was a very nicely woven film with all of the, com the complexities of everybody's different interests. The thing that I wanted to know more about was the relationship of the, um, the shareholders or just people, the people who weren't profiting mm -hmm. uh, to the people who were profiting. And I didn't, that was the one relationship I didn't see anything about. I wondered why, why was that and what's going on there? That's, a great, that's a great question actually. Why? Um, what's the relationship really with the shareholders and Sea Alaska and interestingly enough 50% 50, 50 of the shareholders don't live in the region they don't even live in Alaska and so we've been working really hard and and thankfully been quite successful to get the film to the areas that are very heavily populated by the shareholders and now we have to get them into the rooms to see the film so um, where Seattle is one of the major hubs where a lot mm. of the Haida, Simsian and Clinkit people live um, and we're screening there in about three weeks time so we're really trying because um, the reality is they, they don't vote they give their voting power over to the corporation to the board of directors so when we have um, when some of these shareholders have seen it and go uh, for the first time and go I never knew this was happening to my land and so we're really wanting to bring this into into a room and, and, and into their heart and kind of say listen vote you know like all of us we all get apathetic when we feel that we can't make a difference but they if they vote more they can make a difference so but you did get that voice didn't you those other shareholders yeah the next question well i thought it was a beautiful film um just one question about chronology at one point you showed presumably the greenpeace people up in the trees you know when the mm. police said come on down um at what point was that do you do you remember because the Greenpeace guy was you know going slowly slowly and trying to balance all the interests that was very early on um, there was actually a gentleman uh, unfortunately that passed away because it was it's quite and, and was very instrumental in that work and uh, he went up and was very active and did the the usual Greenpeace kind of work and I think this is what Greenpeace have found interesting about the film and, and at least the US guys um, that not many people know that mm. they don't just do that that they actually do sit around the table with CEOs and have a conversation so that was much earlier before the Greenpeace before the Music Wood Coalition began because that was what they first started with on on the um, 
uh, actually national forest land, and then they moved to look at what the corporations were doing. I hope that helps. Why, why did they stop that activism? Why did Green, you know, That was the valuable part of Greenpeace play. Why did they stop? Well, this was an attempt to tr try and find another way of doing it. I mean, there's only so much. We use it when we still use tactics like that. We use them all the time. We used them in the Russian Arctic a couple of weeks ago, which Absolutely. is why Absolutely. That's what, that's what we want to see. The <laughs> um, they do everything. We've, but we have to try different ways of doing things and this if it had worked would have been fantastic in transforming how that corporation viewed the, its relationship to the forest and to business and it would have given us an example to go to other corporations and other logging companies to say look this can work um, you know I think as well you know your, your earlier question about why that argument wasn't made that this could be a condition of uh, of, of getting the, the 60,000 acres they are after I suspect, I can't speak for the guys there, but I suspect that's exactly the arguments that they were making. But it got no, to a point so. where yeah. you, can, you can't argue with people who don't, who've made a decision not to listen to you. And you can see a combination of, of events, including Gibson being raided, made it impossible for that coalition to work coherently. At the same time, Sea Alaska got back the FSC papers that presumably said they would have to change their behavior in a way that wasn't acceptable for them at the time. And, that's why we are where we are. Also, Sorry if I interrupt. Uh, we've got two questions at the back. Their big Sorry, yeah. like Sting. He's done Excuse more to me. save rainforests. One question all the way at the back first. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Very well balanced between the three sides, and I wondered if it was difficult to ensure all three taking part in the first place. Yeah. But then also, once you had all three on board, whether there was a tension in um, stopping any of one of the three kind of using it as a kind of propaganda piece and sort of hijacking it to promote themselves and. That's a great question, because it was really hard work. Um, and we agreed with everyone we would show it to them before we actually had any general release. And some people wanted more changes than others. And we, you know, A, um, you can't take any money from anybody involved in that film. And that's your first sort of, we would love to have taken money from Gibson to make this film, believe you me. So we can't, that's our, our first sort of uh, benchmark. And then we said to them, we'll show them the film. If we felt that there was any research or any facts we'd got wrong, we would talk to them. But that's the only, and, it, and actually I, I spoke to Scott about this and I said, you know, warts and all, if, if suddenly Greenpeace had rammed a ship, you know, one of their boats into a tree, we would have filmed that. You know, it's, it's just telling the truth. And, and um, talking about the sort of, um, balance, we didn't want people to walk out of here going, that's another environmental doc that is just talking from a Greenpeace, from, you know, because you turn yeah. off half the audience. And that was really important to us. And, and what I love about the fact of the last few months is that there does seem to be some hopeful moves, and may not be from Sea Alaska, but at least from another forest that isn't so far away. So. And that's also the power of editing, that you were able to balance it out so that right. it wouldn't become anybody's. Yeah. yeah. There's another question. Yeah, I think the point about um, the activism is, in, is, you know, that's important, but actually, Max, you said about 50% of the audience might leave here thinking, oh, it's just another propaganda film. Actually, I think the thing is, in the UK, 5 million or 6 million people read The Sun, and you have to convert those people to, you know, and I'm not belittling people that read The Sun, that's up to them, but what I'm saying is actually, you have to convert those people. And I think the more reasoned arguments with people like that, in terms of, you know, the effectiveness of actually, the way these, these issues affect guitars or that affect real people's lives is far more important than actually being doorstepped by another hippie in the street, do you know what I mean? And that's just me generalising, but actually, it's far more valuable for Greenpeace to do work like that, I think, mm -hmm. because it's, it's intelligent, you know, the arguments are good, and I think, I think that's, you can get to more people that way, well actually, and then, then they can go on and argue their point as well, rather than just the activism thing, because although it's important, I think it turns a lot of people off, unfortunately. Uh, for me, I mean, the, the lines in the film that really hit home was the Greenpeace guy saying, well, I do my environmental shit, and they do their shit, and they do their Love shit, and then we talk. And I, I thought that really yeah, was key, absolutely totally. key to the content. Aside from uh, lines of images, for me the strong images were, you know, the ceremony. Three, obviously, was uh, quite heartbreaking. <laughs> what, what was very emotional for you when you were filming? You know, it was so interesting, um, the tree ceremony, because when you're there, you get caught up in the fact that you're watching a Native American tree ceremony. And then someone pointed out to me and said, look how many white people are at this tree ceremony. Where are all the Native Americans? Mm. And then I was, had this light bulb moment of like, yeah, this is not a real Native tree ceremony. Mm. And then, of course, interviewing other Native Americans, and they were like, listen, this is not what we do. <laughs> um, so that was kind of, that was strange. Um, 
Yeah, some of the emotional stuff was was really seeing the huge areas of clear cutting. It was, and then to be on the ground and standing next to this a thousand, you know, almost a thousand year old tree, that was that was very spiritual, you know. Sure. Do we have any more questions? I, I wonder what would happen if you, bearing in mind that let's say ninety nine percent of that spru Sitka spruce. Forest is not actually going to guitar makers, it's actually going to Southeast Asia. Have you thought about showing the film to Southeast Asians? Yeah, I mean, as soon as we as soon as somebody can pay for us for a flight over there, we'll do it. We're at, we have actually talked to an organization about it. We'd love to go over to China. Because that seems meetings. to me to be the problem, not the guitar no, makers. Right. Would, would they're the ones getting shafted by. Well, because by it's, a way of, it's a way of making an argument that you can charge more uh, for less wood. Yeah. Yeah. So you can you take the high value stuff. You look. I mean, what's crazy? It's the same in, in Indonesia. You know, they're pulping uh, rainforest out there, untouched rainforest. It's going into toilet paper. And if you're going to chop down those trees, right? If you make a decision, you're going to cut those trees down. Then the what you want to do it in a way that gets the most value out of those trees, okay? And protects the vast majority of them. Uh, if you're going to cut them down at all, there's an argument for for that as well. But let's, if, once you've made that decision to cut trees down. You need, you need to do it in a way that isn't just pulping them and using it in junk food packaging or in toilet paper, right? And that's where the Southeast Asian rainforests are going and that's where the vast majority of those trees are going. And if we can use, or the, the, the campaign was, you know, the idea of the campaign was to use guitars as this totemic high value product that can say, look, we will pay you more. People will pay more for our guitars and we will pay you more for your wood if you do it in a sustainable manner. Um, you know, and hopefully there's, there's still a, you know, a potential that we can get there. I have a last question, I think. What do you hope this movie will do? Affect some change. You know, I mean, interviewing Vicky, the lady there that got very, very emotional in that interview, you know, I would, I would love, this is not an anti-logging film, because we all need houses to be constructed. We need, you know, but there's ways to do it that people can still live off the land, they can subsistence hunt, they can use logs for their own subsistence living, and an economy can still be made from, from that land. So just do it slightly differently, you know? But also Native Americans, I mean, the Seminole Indians of Florida, who were penniless and impoverished for, for centuries, they've made money from the uh, <coughs> legalizing gambling and alcohol. Yeah. They now own the hard rock cafes and hotels, yeah. and that's creating their do we have any last questions? One. Yeah. I just want to, how does Sea Alaska feel about the film? Um, <laughs> there was a few <coughs> notes from Sea Alaska, <laughs> to say the least. Um, they, it's, it's interesting because people have said that they feel they've walked out of this and they realize how it is difficult for Sea Alaska, you know, because they're a corporation and they're going to be CEOs, head of those corporations, they're going to make a lot of money. Um, but they're, they fit, we were just screening um, in the same city where their head office is and uh, they had full ads in the newspapers saying how they do sustainable forestry and blah de blah and it's just not true unfortunately. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank again Maxine Trump and Richard George from... Uh, oh, can I just say one thing? Sure. Thank you to the Kickstarter supporters that were here, because without you we would not have been able to make this film. Um, they, were, they are wonderful, and if you're making films, do a Kickstarter, because it's brilliant, it's awesome, it makes you don't not feel alone in the filmmaking. Um, I've got to do one quick interview after this, so we're going to the pub around the corner, and we like sort of talking to everybody about the film, so it's the Red Line pub around the corner, Jam Jama German Street and, where were we, Dom? German Street and Duke of York, I think. So um, I'd love to see you there um, in about probably 10 minutes or so. Sure. And I would like to remind you that uh, sharing is caring, so share your thoughts on the movie, uh, Twitter, Facebook, everything, because the movie is great, it's important, and independent film is fantastic. So thank you very much. <laughs>